Five, four, three. Ignition. Three, two, one. Zero. Roger. Lift off. 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 This is your Colby Cast, a weekly roundup of news from the ColbyJack.net world headquarters, flavored with a healthy dose of fiction. Push the button! Welcome to ColbyCast 32 for July 20th, 2011. Hi, I'm R.L. Ferguson. Yep, that's about all I have to say. Oh, that's Colby Jack. He wants in. Let's go get him. Hey, Colby! Jack, come on. Get in here. Come on. Get down to record. Get your butt inside. Ooh. Position under the desk. Go. Can you bark for me, Cole? Of course you can. You're inside. You're with me hanging out. Okay, now that we got Colby Jack in the studio. I was going to interview him, but his vocabulary is kind of limited, and he thinks that every time I talk to him, I'm mad. So his ears go back. Hmm. So anyway... Today we are in the middle of another scorcher. (laughs) Love summer, don't we? The thermometer exploded. I think that's a sign from God that I should hide in my cave. It's the only thing I can do. We have a little bit of news this week. Eh, That's more like reminders than news, really. There isn't much exciting happening at this moment. Oh yeah, we are currently 12 days away from our relaunch on August 1. Yay! What's a relaunch and why should you care? Yeah, good question, really. Just thought of it before I wrote this. A relaunch is a psychological treatment the creators of a program go through, like myself, whereby they cast off the old, substandard works of the past in an attempt to present the best content possible. Basically, it's an excuse to clear out the rubbish and try to look nicer to the new folks that we hope come by to check us out. Come on, we're needy. As far as why you should care, I don't have a clue. Really. I just write stuff, perform stuff, edit stuff, do stuff with stuff, and hope that someone likes it. Really, that's about it. So, basically, for those of us not in the know, what a relaunch is, is a blatant excuse to try to get people to like us more. There, I said it. You still like me? That said, starting August 1... These are mine, and Death of a Shady Dame, as well as the first 23-ish episodes of the Colby cast, will be sent to the attic display room at the back of the broom closet, just behind the tins of floor wax, where they will be prominently displayed for all to see. For those of you who don't speak illogic or mockery, basically what it means is that these are mine, Death of a Shady Dame, quit looking at me like that, and the first 23 episodes of the Colby cast will be removed from the feed. They will still be available in either individual episodes or monumental zip archive downloads on their own pages. So if you enjoyed them, we thank you for your generosity and good humor, as you must indeed be saints. Now on to the future. As those of you who have followed us over the last few months know, we've changed format a bit and have dedicated ourselves to presenting the best serial fiction that others will allow us to present. And if they won't let us, then we just head off to good old Gutenberg and see what they've got happening. I mean, the work we're performing this week, we do this week, is from Gutenberg. And so we are grateful for those hardy salvage operators of the literary seas for their valiant effort to fight off the guys with the stuff who stopped them from doing stuff. Okay, that's really what we're at. Okay, we're now to the time where I tell you, hey, if you got anything you want us to take a look at, and no, I will not look at that. Really. That was such an easy response. I figured you would all just overlook it. But really, this is not chat roulette. Okay, here's the words of what we're looking for. We want manuscripts from 3,000 words and up. We want them to be science fiction, fantasy, horror, or other genres. Really, we don't care. That are not smut. Like a Supreme Court justice, I will know it when I seize it. We don't want romance or paranormal romance. Sorry, I guess it's not other genres doesn't include, you know, romance, so sorry. The work has to be published somewhere. Self-pub counts. If you've got an Amazon novel, you want to help push it, maybe get some more people onto it, hey, send it over here. We'll give it a read, see if we like it. Oh yeah, we don't pay. They don't pay me either, so. But you get to keep all the rights. All we're asking is the right to put it up 
and leave it out there with a Creative Commons license on it so people can get it. Okay, we accept Doc, DocX, RTF, HTML, EPUB, or Mobi. So if you know what any of those means, you can use them. And you send them to rlferguson at colbyjack.net, which is also the same address to which you send comments, complaints, flames, marriage proposals, whatever. That would be rlferguson at colbyjack.net. The subject line should include the word submission, your name, and the title of your piece. If you're not sending in a piece, don't use the word submission, because then I think it might be a date. Seriously, other podcasts beg for money. We just beg for content, so be glad. Who do we have on tap for the new lineup? Um, really, um... Okay, here's the big guns. You ready for this? I don't think you can handle this. We have nothing less than For the Win by Cory Doctorow coming here to ColbyJack.net. It's a monster of a book. Weighs about a ton. I really should read it. It'll be presented in 37 episodes. That's right, 37. Starting August 1 and running, well, for 36 more weeks every Monday. Nifty how that works. Right now, I am up to Chapter 23 and well within the bounds of my schedule to finish the recording phase by July 25th. That's right, in an eight-day period, I've recorded over 103,000 words. Yesterday, that would be the 19th, I recorded six episodes. That's right, in one day, my day off, mind you, I hid in the basement with my lovely Colby Jack at my feet and recorded over 24,000 words. (laughs) I feel like a rock star or a marathon runner or maybe just a guy who sits on a stool and reads words off a screen into a microphone. That's probably it. I hope it's good. I am so far into the process that I can't even judge the quality anymore. Really. It's all in pre-production record mode. So I'd have to layer a bunch of stuff onto the track just to get my patented sound. So sexy. So all I have is rough tracks to check, and they sound fine. It'll be fine. Everything will be fine. If I stick to my schedule of three a day, I will finish on time which will also be fine. Which will be on time to begin soundtracking them as quickly as I can, which will be at the same speed as usual, with tortoise grace, elephantine speed, and swan strength. Wow, that should be my new character motto when I change forms. Like, thunder, thunder, thundercats, you know. Yeah, my my Dragon Ball Z call. Oh, other things for the relaunch. A newly re-recorded and soundtracked Mouse Queen will be presented on Fridays. 13 episodes of fun. Why am I redoing The Mouse Queen? Really? Because, well, I got the book in print, ebook, and physical through Amazon, Nook, Smashwords, iBook, Kobo, Sony. Sony? That should be Sony. <laughs> Sony Bookstore. I like the Sony Bookstore better because, you know, it's like it's funny. It's because it's Sony, but you put an extra N in there, it becomes Sunny, like Sunny and Share. Oh, basically, everywhere they let me in. And, well, honestly, the Mouse Queen was my first recorded effort. And it shows. Yes, I know I have it on patio books as well. And I'll have to change it there as well. Evo already knows. So my work is never really ending. Really, people. Late in the audio version of The Mouse Queen, I changed Tulip's husband's name for a whole chapter. Then changed it back. Didn't catch that one until Trish pointed it out to me. What was it? The third edit pass? Yeah, really. It is that embarrassing. So we will be relaunching it here and on patio books, complete with soundtrack and actual editing. (laughs) Heck, the re-recording actually found errors that had been missed on the previous five or six edit passes, which we updated shortly to the various bookmakers. Hey, don't you love modern publishing? Make a mistake, and it's only in the versions that sold. And if it's electronic, the next time they download it, the error will be gone. That is awesome. I think I could actually use this to drive someone batty put their name in the book, they get excited, start blogging about how cool they are, they then snap, change the file, and every new version shows them a fool. Oh, such tools we beings of ultimate power have. Huh. Okay, got it. Well, I've chewed your ears off long enough, time to jump into our story. The Night of the Long Knives by Fritz Leiber, part four. <laughs> this is the part of the podcast where I point out which episode contains which part. Really? Do you really need that? When did it start? Can't figure it out. Not my problem anymore. The story so far. 
our narrator, a survivor of a nuclear apocalypse, meets an enigmatic woman in the wilderness. A woman with a lovely scar, a dark pistol, and a hook for a hand. Of course, he falls in love with her right away. Naturally, they succumb to good old urge number two. Urge number one being murder. And they get it all like Donkey Kong alongside a ruined petroleum cracking plant. <laughs> How romantic. I remember it like it was in Colby Gas 29. <laughs> the next morning, a strange aircraft lands near them. And like a couple of old pros, the pair arrange to do a little of the old ultraviolence. Which is really a reference to Clockwork Orange, but you know, we work it in here. They kill the pilot. Yep, deader than a doornail. Just as they are trying to come to grips with the fact that every bit of metal on the pilot, his gun, his pocket knife, his robot chicken, they all melt into puddles of goo that starts anything it touches smoldering. Which is, of course, when a mysterious stranger pokes his head around the plane and asks them why they lit the guy on fire. That was Colby Cast 30, for those of you keeping score with the home game. Which leads to us to our happy murderer getting a plane. Check it out. Heck, we actually get to know the characters' names. Ray, the dashing narrator. Alice, the sexy beast with a hook for a hand. And Pops, the crazy old coot. <laughs> We're left with Pops smacking a few buttons, and our heroes are locked into the crazy plane, flying to God knows where. So grab your gas mask, Geiger counter, favorite knife, atomic bomb, whatever you need, as we trek into the wastes of Neverwhere during the time of Never When with the Night of the Long Knives by Fritz Leiber. <laughs> ah, that hurts a lot. <laughs> the Night of the Long Knives by Fritz Leiber. Chapter 4. Any man who deals in murder must have very incorrect ways of thinking and truly inaccurate principles. Thomas De Quincey in Murder Considered as One of the Fine Arts For that matter, we took off fast, with the plane swinging to beat hell. Alice and me was in the two kneeling seats and we hugged them tight. But Pop was loose and sort of rattled around the cabin for a while. And serve him right. On one of the swings, I caught a glimpse of the seven dented gas tanks, looking like dull crescents from this angle, through the orange haze and getting rapidly smaller as they hazed out. After a while, the plane leveled off and quit swinging. And a while after that, my image of the cabin quit swinging too. Once again, I just managed to stave off the vomits. This time, the vomits from natural causes. Alice looked very pale around the gills and kept her face buried in the chin rest of her chair. Pop ended up right in her faces, sort of spread eagled against the instrument panel. In getting himself off it, he must have braced his hand against half the buttons at one time or another, and I noticed that none of them went down a fraction. They were locked. It had probably happened automatically when the at la high button got pushed. I'd have stopped him messing around in that apish way, but with the ultra queasy state of my stomach, I lacked all ambition and was happy just not to be smelling him so close. I still wasn't taking too great an interest in things as I idly watched the old geezer rummaging around the cabin for something that got misplaced in the shakeup. Eventually, he found it a small almond shaped can. He opened it. Sure enough, it turned out to have almonds in it. He fitted himself in the back seat and munched them one at a time. Ish. Nothing like a few nuts to top off with, he said cheerfully. I could have cut his throat even more cheerfully. But the damage had been done, and you think twice before you kill a person in close quarters when you aren't absolutely sure you'll be able to dispose of the body. How did I know I'd be able to open the door? I remember philosophizing that Pop ought to at least have broken an arm so he'd be as badly off as Alice and me. Though for that matter, my right arm was fully recovered now. But he was all in one piece. There's no justice in events, that's for sure. The plane plowed along silently through the orange soup, though there was really no way to tell it was moving now. Until a skewy spindle shape loomed up ahead and shot pack over the viewport. I think it was a vulture. I don't know how vultures managed to operate in the haze, 
which ought to cancel their keen eyesight. But they do. It shot past fast. Alice lifted her face out of the sponge stuff and began to study the buttons again. I heaved myself up and around a little and said, Pop, Alice and me are going to try to work out how this plane navigates. This time we don't want no interference. I didn't say a word more about what he'd done. It never does to hash over stupidities. That's perfectly fine. Go right ahead, he told me. I feel calm as a kitten now. We're going somewheres. That's all that ever matters with me. He chuckled a bit and added, You gotta admit, I gave you and Alice something to work with. But then he had the sense to shut up tight. We weren't so cherry of pushing buttons this time. But ten minutes or so convinced us that you couldn't push any of the buttons anymore. They were all locked down. All locked except for maybe one, which we didn't try at first for a special reason. We looked for other controls, sticks, levers, pedals, finger holes, and the like. There weren't any. Alice went back and tried the buttons on Pop's minor console. They were locked too. Pop looked interested but didn't say a word. We realized in a general way what had happened, of course. Pushing the at high button had set us on some kind of irreversible automatic. I couldn't imagine the why of gimmicking a plane's controls like that. It was maybe to keep loose children or prisoners from being able to mess things up while the pilot took a snooze. But there were a lot of whys to this plane that didn't seem to have any standard answers. The business of taking off on irreversible automatic had happened so neatly that I naturally wondered whether Pop might not know more about navigating this plane than he let on. A whole lot more, in fact. And the seeming idiotic petulance of his pushing all the buttons have been a shrewd cover for pushing the Atla High button. But if Pop had been acting, he'd been acting beautifully, with a serene disregard for the chances of breaking his own neck. I decided this was a possibility I could think about later, and maybe act on then, after Alice and me had worked through the more obvious stuff. The reason we hadn't tried the one button yet was that it showed a green nimbus, just like the Atla High button had had a violet nimbus. Now there was no green on either of the screens except for the tiny green star that I figured stood for the plane. It didn't make sense to go where we already were. And if it meant some other place, some place not shown on the screens, you bet we weren't going to be too quick about deciding to go there. It might not be on Earth. Alice expressed it by saying, My namesake was always a little too quick at responding to those drink-me cues. I suppose she thought she was being cryptic, but I fooled her. Alice in Wonderland? I asked. She nodded and gave me a little smile. Not at all like one of the eat me smiles she'd give me last evening. It is funny how crazily happy a little touch of the intellectual past like that can make you feel and how horribly uncomfortable a moment later. We both started to study the North America screen again and almost at once we realized that it had changed in one small particular. The green star had twinned. Where there had been one point of green light, there were now two, very close together like the double star in the handle of the dipper. We watched it for a while. The distance between the two stars grew perceptibly greater. We watched it for a while longer, considerably longer. It became clear that the position of the more westerly star on the screen was fixed, while the more easterly star was moving east toward Atla High with about the speed of the tip of the minute hand on a wristwatch. Two inches an hour, say. The pattern began to make sense. I figured it this way. The moving star must stand for the plane. The other green dot must stand for where the plane had just been. For some reason, the spot on the freeway by the old Kraken plant was recognized as a marked locality by the screen. Why, I don't know. It reminded me of the old X marks the spot of newspaper murders. But that would be getting very fancy. Anyway, the spot we had just taken off from was so marked, and in that case, the button with the green nimbus. 
Hold tight, everybody, I said to Alice, grudgingly including Pop in my warning. I gotta try it. I gripped my seat with my knees and one arm and pushed the green button. It pushed. The plane swung around in a level loop, not too tight to disturb the stomach much, and steadied out again. I couldn't judge how far we'd swung, but Alice and me watched the green stars, and after about a minute she said, They're getting closer. And a little while later I said, Yeah, for sure. I scanned the board. The green button, the cracking plant button to call it that, was locked down, of course. The Atla High button was up, glowing violet. All the other buttons were still up and locked up. I tried them all again. It was clear as day used to be. We could either go to Atla High or we could go back where we'd started from. There was no third possibility. It was a little hard to take. You think of a plane as freedom, as something that will carry you anywhere in the world you choose to go, especially any paradise, and then you find yourself worse limited than if you'd stayed on the ground. At least that was the way it was happening to us. But Alice and me were realists. We knew it wouldn't help to wail. We were up against another of those two problems, the problem of two destinations, and we had to choose ours. If we go back, I thought, we can trek on somewhere, anywhere, richer by the loot from the plane, especially that survival kit. Trek on with some loot we'll mostly never understand, and with the knowledge that we're leaving a plane that can fly, that we are shrinking back from an unknown adventure. Also, if we go back, there's something else we have to face, something we'll have to live with for a little while at least, that won't be nice to live with after this cozy personal cabin. Something that shouldn't bother me at all, but damn it, it does. Alice made the decision for us, and at the same time showed she was thinking about the same thing as me. I don't want to have to smell him, Ray, she said. I am not going back to keep company with that filthy corpse. I'd rather anything than that. And she pushed the Atla High button again, and as the plane started to swing, she looked at me defiantly, as if to say... I'd reverse the course again over her dead body. Don't tense up, I told her. I want a new shake of the dice myself. You know, Alice, Pop said reflectively, it was the smell of my Alamoser got to me too. I just couldn't bear it. I couldn't get away from it because my fever had me pinned down. So there was nothing left for me to do but go crazy. No Atla High for me, just Bugland. My mind died, though not my memory. By the time I got my strength back, I'd started to be a new bugger. I don't know no more about living than a newborn babe, except I knew I couldn't go back. Go back to murdering and all that. My new mind knew that much. Though otherwise it was just a blank. It was all very funny. And then I suppose... Alice cut in, her voice corrosive with sarcasm. You hunted up a wandering preacher, or perhaps a kindly old hermit who lived on a hot manna, and he showed you the blue sky. Why no, Alice, Pop said. I told you I don't go for religion. As it happened, I hunted me up a couple of murderers. Guys who were worse cases than myself, but who'd wanted to quit because it wasn't getting them nowhere. And who'd found, I'd heard, a way of quitting. And the three of us had a long talk together. And they told you the great secret of how to live in the Deathlands without killing. Alice continued acidly. Drop the nonsense, Pop. It can't be done. It's hard, I'll grant you, Pop said. You have to go crazy or something almost as bad. In fact, maybe going crazy is the easiest way. But it can't be done, and in the long run, murder is even harder. I decided to interrupt this idle chatter. Since we were now definitely headed for Atla High, and there was nothing to do until we got there, unless one of us got a brainstorm about the controls, it was time to start on the less obvious stuff I'd tabled in my mind. Why are you on this plane, Pop? I asked sharply. What do you figure on getting out of Alice and me? And I don't mean the free meals. 
He grinned. His teeth were white and even. Plates, of course. Why, Ray, he said. I was just giving Alice the reason. I like to talk to murderers. Practicing murderers preferred. I need to have to talk to them to keep myself straight. Otherwise, I might start killing again, and I'm not up to that anymore. Oh, so you get your kicks at second hand, you old peeper. Alice put in, but... Quit lying, Pop, I said. About having quit killing. For one thing, in my books, which happen to be the old books in this case, the accomplice is every bit as guilty as the man with the slicer. You helped us kill the pilot by giving that funny scream, and you know it. Who says I did? Pop countered, rearing up a little. I never said so. I just said, forget it. He hesitated a moment, studying me. Then he said, I wasn't the one gave that scream. In fact, I'd have stopped it if I'd been able. Who then? Again, he studied me as he hesitated. I'm not telling, he said, settling back. Pop, I said sharp again. Buggers who pad together tell everything. Oh, yeah? He agreed, smiling. I remember saying that to quite a few guys in my day. It's a very restful, comradely sentiment. I killed every last one of them, too. You may have, Pop, I granted. But we're two to one. So you are, he agreed softly, looking the both of us over. I knew what he was thinking, that Alice still had just her pliers on. And in these close quarters, his knives were as good as my gun. Give me your right hand, Alice. I said, without taking my eyes off Pop, I reached a knife without a handle out of her belt. And then I started to unscrew the pliers out of her stump. Pop, I said as I did so. You may have quit killing for all I know. I mean, you may have quit killing clean, decent, Deathland style. But I don't believe one bit of that guff about having to talk to murderers to keep your mind sweet. Furthermore... It's true, though, he interrupted. I got to keep myself reminded of how lousy it feels to be a murderer. So, I said, well, here's one person who believes you've got a more practical reason for being on this plane. Pop, what is the bounty at the high gives you for every Deathlander you bring in? What would it be for two live Deathlanders? And what sort of reward would they pay for a lost plane brought in? Seems to me they might very well make you a citizen for that. Yes, even give you your own church, Alice added with a sort of wicked gaiety. I squeezed her stump gently to tell her let me handle it. Why, I guess you can believe that if you want to, Pop said and let out a soft breath. Seems to me you need a lot of coincidences and happenstances to make that theory hold water. But you sure can believe it if you want to. I got no way, Ray, to prove to you I'm telling the truth except to say I am. Right, I said, and then I threw the next one at him real fast. One more, Pop. Weren't you traveling this plane to begin with? That cuts a happenstance. Did you hop out while we were too busy with the pilot to notice and just pretend to be coming from the Kraken plant? Weren't the buttons locked because you were the pilot's prisoner? Pop creased his brow thoughtfully. It could have been that way, he said at last. Could have been, according to the evidence as you saw it. It's quite a bright idea, Ray. I could almost see myself skulking in this cabin while you and Alice... You were skulking somewhere. I said. I finished screwing in the knife and gave Alice back her hand. I'll repeat it, Pop. I said. We're two to one. You better talk. Yes, Alice added, disregarding my previous hint. You may have given up fighting, Pop, but I haven't. Not fighting, nor killing, nor anything in between those two. Any least thing. My girl was being her most pantherish. Now who says I've given up fighting? Pop demanded, rearing a little again. You people assume too much. It's a dangerous habit. Before we have any trouble when someone's
squawks about me cheating, let's get one thing straight. If anybody jumps me, I'll try to disable them. I'll try to hurt them in any way short of killing. And that means hamstringing and rabbit punching and everything else. Every least thing, Alice. And if they happen to die while I'm honestly just trying to hurt them in a way short of killing, then I won't grieve too much. My conscience will be reasonably clear. Is that understood? I had to admit that it was. Pop might be lying about a lot of things, but I just didn't believe he was lying about this. And I already knew Pop was quick for his age and strong enough. If Alice and me jumped him now, there'd be blood let six different ways. You can't jump a man who has a dozen knives easy to hand and not expect that to happen. Two to one or not. We'd get him in the end, but it would be gory. And now, Pop said quietly, I will talk a little if you don't mind. Look here, Ray, Alice, the two of you are confirmed murderers. I know you wouldn't tell me nothing different, and being such you both know that there's nothing in murder in the long run. It satisfies a hunger and maybe gets you a little loot, and it lets you get on to the next killing. But that's all, absolutely all. You gotta do it because it's the way you're built. The urge is there. It's an overpowering urge and you got nothing to oppose it with. You feel the big grief and the big resentment. The dust is eating at your bones. You can't stand the city squares, the porterites and the mantars and such because you know they're whistling in the dark. And it's a dirty tune. So you go on killing. But if there were a decent, practical way to quit, you'd take it. At least I think you would. When you still thought this plane could take you to Rio or Europe, you felt that way, didn't you? You weren't planning to go there as murderers, were you? You were going to leave your trade behind. It was pretty quiet in the cabin for a couple of seconds. Then Alice's thin laugh sliced the silence. We were dreaming then, she said. We were out of our heads. But now you're talking about practical things, as you say. What do you expect us to do if we quit our trade, as you call it? Go into Walla Walla or Oachita and give ourselves up? I might lose more than my right hand at Oachita this time. That was just on suspicion. Or at Lahai, I added meaningfully. Are you expecting us to admit we're murderers when we get to at Lahai, Pop? The old geezer smiled and thinned his eyes. Now that wouldn't accomplish much, would it? Most places that just string you up, maybe after tickling your pain nerves a bit, or if it was Mantano, they might put you in a cage and feed you slops and pray over you. And would that help you or anybody else? If a man or woman quits killing, there's a lot of things he's got to straighten out. First his own mind and feelings. Next, he's got to do what he can to make up for the murders he's done. Help the next kid, if any, and so on. Then he's got to carry the news to other killers who haven't heard it yet. He's got no time to waste being hanged. Believe me, he's got work lined up for him. Work that's got to be done mostly in the Deathlands, and the sort of work the city squares can't help him with one bit. Because they just don't understand us murderers and what makes us tick. We have to do it ourselves. Hey, Pop. I cut in, getting a little interested in the argument. There wasn't anything else to get interested in until we got to At Lahai, or Pop let down his guard. I dig you on the city squares. I call them cultural queers, and what sort of screwed up fatheads they are. But just the same for a man to quit killing, he's got to quit lone wolfing it. He's got to belong to a community. He's got to have culture of some sort, no matter how disgusting or nutsy. Well, Pop said, Don't us Deathlanders have a culture? With customs and folkways and all the rest? A very tight little culture, in fact. Nutsy as all get out, of course. But that's one of the beauties of it. Oh, sure, I granted him. But it's a culture based on murder and devoted wholly to murder. Murder's our way of life. That gets your argument nowhere, Pop. Correction, he said, or rather, reinterpretation. And now, for a little while, his voice got less old man harsh, and yet bigger somehow. 
as if it were more than just pop talking. Every culture, he said, is a way of growth as well as a way of life, because the first law of life is growth. Our Deathland culture is devoted to growing through murder away from murder. It's about the toughest way of growth anybody has ever asked to face up to, but it's a way of growth just the same. A lot bigger and fancier cultures never could figure out the answer to the problem of war and killing. We know that. All right. We inhabit their greatest failure. Maybe us Deathlanders, working with murder every day, unable to pretend that it isn't part of every one of us, unable to put it out of our minds like the city squares do. Maybe us Deathlanders are the ones to do that little job. Well, Pop, I objected, getting excited in spite of myself. Even if we've got a culture here in the Deathlands, a culture that can grow, it ain't a culture that can deal with repentant murderers. In a real culture, a murderer feels guilty and confesses. And then he gets hanged or imprisoned a long time, and that squares things for him and everybody. You need religion and courts and hangmen and screws and all the rest of it. I don't think it's enough for a man just to say he's sorry and go around glad-handing other killers. That isn't going to be enough to wipe out his sense of guilt. Pop squared his eyes at mine. Are you so fancy that you have to have a sense of guilt, Ray? He demanded. Can't you just see when something's lousy? A sense of guilt's a luxury. Of course it's not enough to say you're sorry. You're going to have to spend a good part of the rest of your life making up for what you've done. And what you will do, too. But about hanging in prisons? Was it ever proved those were the right thing for murderers? As for religion now, some of us who've quit killing are religious. And a lot of us, me included, aren't. And some of the ones that are religious figure, maybe because there's no way for them to get hanged, that they're damned eternally. But that doesn't stop them doing good work. I ask you now, is any little thing like being damned eternally a satisfactory excuse for behaving like a complete rat? That did it somehow. That last statement of Pops appealed so much to me, it was completely crazy at the same time, that I couldn't help warming up to him. Don't get me wrong. I didn't really fall for his line of chatter at all, but I found it fun to go along with it, so long as the plane was in this shuttle position and we had nothing better to do. Al seemed to feel the same way. I guess any booger that could kid religion the way Pop could got a little silver star in her books. Bronze, anyway. Right away, the atmosphere got easier. To start with, we asked Pop to tell us about this us he kept mentioning, and he said it was some dozens or hundreds, nobody had accurate figures, of killers who'd quit and went nomading around the Deathlands trying to recruit others and help those who wanted to be helped. They had semi-permanent meeting places where they tried to get together at prearranged dates, but mostly they kept on the go by twos and threes or, more rarely, alone. They were all men so far, at least Pop hadn't heard of any women members, but he assured Alice earnestly he would personally guarantee that there'd be no objections to a girl joining up. They had recently taken to calling themselves Murderers Anonymous, after some pre-war organization Pop didn't know the original purpose of. Quite a few of them had slipped and gone back to murdering again, but some of these had come back after a while, more determined than ever, to make a go of it. We welcomed them, of course, Pop said. We welcome everybody. Everybody that's a genuine murderer, that is, and says he wants to quit. Guys that aren't blooded yet, we draw the line at, no matter how fine they are. Also, we have a lot of fun at our meetings, Pop assured us. You never saw such high times. Nobody's got a right to go glooming around or pull a long face just because he's done a killing or two. Religion or no religion, pride's a sin. Alice and me ate it all up like we were a couple of kids and Pop was telling us fairy tales. That's what it all was, of course. A fairy tale. A crazy, mixed up fairy tale. Alice and me knew there could be no fellowship of Deathlanders like Pop was describing. It was impossible as blue sky. But it gave us a kick to pretend to ourselves for a while to believe in it. 
Bob could talk forever, apparently, about murder and murderers, and he had a bottomless bag of funny stories on the same topic and character vignettes. The murderers who were forever wanting their victims to understand and forgive them. The ones who thought of themselves as little kings with divine rights of dispensing death. The ones who insisted on laying down, chastely, beside their finished victims and playing dead for a couple of hours. The ones who weren't so chaste. The ones who could only do their killings when they were dressed in a certain way. And the troubles they had with their murder costumes. The ones who could only kill people with certain traits or of a certain appearance. Red beard, say, or people who read books. Or who couldn't carry tunes or use bad language. The ones who always mix sex and murder. And the ones who believed that murder was contaminated by the least breath of sex. The sticklers and the sloppy joes, the artists and the butchers, the axe and stiletto types, the compulsives and the repulsives. Honestly, Pop's portraits from life added up to a dance of death as good as anything the Middle Ages ever produced. And they ought to have been illustrated like those by some great artist. Pop told us a lot about his own killings too. Alice and me was interested. But neither of us wasn't tempted into making parallel revelations about ourselves. Your private life's your own business, I felt. As close as your guts. And no joke's good enough to justify revealing a knot of it. Not that we talked about nothing but murder while we were bolding along toward Atla High. The conversation was freewheeling. And we got onto all sorts of topics. For instance, we got to talking about the plane and how it flew itself. Or levitated itself, rather. I said it must generate an anti-gravity field that was key to the body of the plane, but nothing else. So that we didn't feel lighter, nor any of the objects in the cabin. It just worked on the dull, silvery metal. And I proved my point by using Mother to shave a little wisp of metal off the edge of the control board. The curly cue stayed in the air wherever you put it, and when you moved it, you could feel the faintest sort of gyroscopic resistance. It was very strange. Pop pointed out it was a little like magnetism. A germ riding on an iron filing that was traveling toward the pole of a big magnet wouldn't feel the magnetic pull. It wouldn't be operating at him, only on the iron. But just the same, the germ would be carried along with the filing and feel its acceleration and all, provided he could hold on. But for that purpose, you could imagine a tiny cabin in the filing. That's what we are, Pop added. Three germs, jumbo size. Alice wanted to know why an anti-gravity plane should have even the stubbiest wings or a jet for that matter. For we remembered now we'd noticed the tubes. And I said it was maybe just a reserve system in case the anti-gravity failed. And Pop guessed it might be for extra fast battle maneuvering. Or even for operating outside the atmosphere. Which hardly made sense as I proved to him. If we're a battle plane, where's our guns? Alice asked. None of us had an answer. We remembered the noise the plane had made before we saw it. It must have been using its jets then. And do you suppose, Pop asked, that it was something from the anti-gravity that made electricity flare out of the top of the cracking plant? Like to have scared the pants off me. No answer to that either. Now was a logical time, of course to ask Pop what he knew about the Kraken plant and just who had done the scream if not him. But I figured he still wouldn't talk. As long as we were acting friendly, there was no point in spoiling it. We guessed around a little, though, about where the plane came from. Pop said Alamos. I said Atla High. Alice said why not from both? Why couldn't Alamos and Atla High have some sort of treaty and the plane be traveling from the one to the other? We agreed it might be. At least it fitted with the Atla High violet and the Alamos blue being brighter than the other colors. I just hope we got some sort of anti-collision radar, I said. I guess we had, because twice we'd jogged in our course a little. Maybe to clear the Alleghenies. The easterly green star was by now getting pretty close to the violet blob of Atla High. I looked out at the orange soup, which was one thing that hadn't changed a bit so far. And I got to wishing like a baby that it wasn't there, and to thinking how it blanketed the whole earth. Stars over the Riviera, don't make me laugh. And I heard myself asking, Pop, 
Did you rub out that guy that pushed the buttons for all this? No, Pop answered without hesitation, just as if it hadn't been four hours or so since he'd mentioned the point. Nope, Ray. Fact is, I welcomed him into our little fellowship about six months back. This is his knife here. This horn handle in my boot, though he never killed with it. He claimed he'd been tortured for years by the thought of millions and millions he'd killed with blast and radiation. But now he was finding peace at last because he was where he belonged, with the murderers, and could start to do something about it. Several of the boys didn't want to let him in. They claimed he wasn't a real murderer, doing it by remote control, no matter how many he bumped off. I'd have been on their side, Alice said, thin in her lips. Yes, Pop continued. They got real hot about it. He got hot too and all excited and offered to go out and kill somebody with his bare hands right off. Or try to. He's a skinny little runt. If that's what he had to do to join, we argued it over. I pointed out that we let ex-soldiers count the killings they'd done in service. And that we counted poisonings and booby traps and such too. Which are remote control killings in a way. So eventually we'd let him in. He's doing good work. We're fortunate to have him. Do you think he's really the guy who pushed the buttons? I asked Pop. How should I know? Pop replied. He claims to be. I was going to say something about people who faked confessions to get a little easy glory, as compared to the guys who were really guilty and would sooner be chopped up than talk about it. But at that moment, a fourth voice started talking in the plane. It seemed to be coming out of the violet patch on the North America screen. That is, it came from the general direction of the screen at any rate, my mind instantly tied it to the violet patch of Atla High. It gave us a fright, I can tell you. Alice grabbed my knee with her pliers. She changed again. Harder than she intended, I suppose. Though I didn't let out a yip, I was too defensively frozen. The voice was talking a language I didn't understand at all that went up and down the scale like a tonal music. It sounds like Chinese, Pop whispered, giving me a nudge. It is Chinese. Mandarin. The screen responded instantly in the purest English. At least that was how I'd describe it. Practically Boston. Who are you? And where's Grail? Come in, Grail. I knew well enough who Grail must be, or rather, have been. I looked at Pop and Alice. Pop grinned. Maybe a mite freely this time, I thought, and gave me a look as if to say, You want to handle it? I cleared my throat, then. We've taken over for Grail, I said to the screen. Oh, the screen hesitated, just barely. Then, do any of you speak Mandarin? I hardly bothered to look at Pop and Alice. No, I said. Oh, again a tiny pause. Is Grail aboard the plane? No, I said. Oh. Incapacitated in some way, I suppose? Yes, I said, grateful for the screen's tactfulness, unintentional or not. But you have taken over for him, the screen pressed. Yes, I said, swallowing. I didn't know what I was getting us into. Things were moving too fast, but it seemed the merest sense to act cooperative. I'm very glad of that. The screen said with something in its tone that made me feel funny. I guess it was sincerity. Then it said, Is he? And hesitated, and started again with, Are the blocks aboard? I thought. Alice pointed at the stuff she dumped out of the other seat. I said, There's a box with a thousand or so one-inch underweight steel cubes in it. Like a child's blocks, but with buttons in them alongside a box with a parachute. That's what I mean, the screen said, and somehow, maybe because whoever was talking was trying to hide it, I caught a note of great relief. Look, the screen said, more rapidly now, I don't know how much you know, but we may have to work very fast. You aren't going to be able to deliver the steel cubes to us directly. In fact, you aren't going to be able to land in Atlantic Highlands at all. We're sieged in by planes and ground forces of Savannah Fortress, 
All our aircraft, such as haven't been destroyed, are pinned down. You're going to have to parachute the blocks to a point as near as possible to one of our ground parties that makes a sortie. We'll give you a signal. I hope it will be later, nearer here, that is. But it may be sooner. Do you know how to fight the plane you're in? Operate its armament? No, I said, wetting my lip. Then that's the first thing I'd best teach you. Anything you see in the haze from now on will be from Savannah. You must shoot it down. This has been a Colby Cast episode. This work is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non Commercial No Derivatives License. Share it, link it, blog it, talk about it. As Woody Guthrie said, this song is copyrighted in the U.S. under seal of copyright number 154085 for a period of 28 years. And anybody caught singing it without our permission will be a mighty good friend to earn because we don't give a darn. Publish it, write it, sing it, swing to it, yodel it. We wrote it, that's all we wanted to do.